So we've been going through this series, uh, I think this will be the sixth episode in Church for Gamers, going through Ecclesiastes, and through the series, or throughout the series, I've been speaking about life's eventually going to hit you upside the head. Well, I was reading this article today, and I had to talk about it a little bit before we continue on into chapter five. So the story goes like this. This took place back in July of 2014. Husband and wife are driving down a highway in Ohio. And these four kids were on top of an overpass and they had a five pound rock and they, being stupid like kids are at that age, they decided to drop the rock on an, in, an oncoming car in traffic. The rock goes right through the windshield, hits the wife in the head, and she is... <sighs> it's so hard for me to even talk about it. I mean, I was reading the article and I almost started crying because she ended up going through seven brain surgeries, lost an eye basically brain dead, eventually dies. Well, the husband didn't want the, uh, the death to be for naught, and uh, he decides to change something. And the only thing he could think of was adding gates or fences to the tops of these overpasses so this would never happen again to somebody. And he got together with some of the state senators and they fought this bill and they got it through, and it wasn't even that expensive of a bill for the state. And, and it passed, finally. And then the husband killed himself. He just could not live life anymore without his wife. You know, this woman that was created for the sole purpose of being his wife. And they had it sounded like they had a wonderful marriage. They had children. And he just could not go through life anymore without her. And you know what? I, I, I hate to say it, but I don't blame him. I mean, when you find that woman that you're just meant to be with and you love her with everything inside of you and she's the mother of your children and... She knows everything about you and she accepts every imperfection because that's what marriage is about. It's learning each other's imperfections and trusting each other with everything that you've got and knowing that that person won't abandon you or hurt you because of those. And, and he lost that partner, that, that person who God had created to walk through life with him and it was over. You know, I talk about, you know, as you're going through life, you know, Solomon speaks on enjoying each and every day the goodness of God and the little things, you know, your food and your drink and the time that you have with your wife and with your kids and with your friends, you know, the vacations you have because eventually life is going to step up and smack you in the face. But when it does, you guys, it doesn't give us a right to end ourselves. Okay, I'm not saying that what he did was wrong. It's, I can understand where he's coming from with that loss, that depression that he felt. And of course, he wanted her life to be, not to be for naught, and he, he decided to battle. But when all was said and done, he couldn't live with, live with himself anymore. He just he couldn't do this life without her. And this is what God talks about a lot in the Bible is, you're going to get hit. Unjust things are going to happen to you. Wicked things are going to happen. Evil will prevail upon you many times in your life. People are going to die around you. Some people are going to get cancer. Some's going to be tragedies. You're going to lose your job. Girls are going to break your heart. Kids are going to disobey and run away. You may very well have a prodigal child who gets into drugs. You may have a child who goes to prison. You may have a child who goes into the military and dies. I mean, there's no telling what's going to take place in your life, but you don't give up. The idea behind all of this, the way I've always pictured it and had perspective upon it was that God's going to take you down. God's going to bring you to your knees. And the sole purpose of him doing that is so you will trust in him no matter what's going on in your life. Now, I've never been able to quite understand how people who do not believe in God and Jesus Christ as their Savior, how they can make it each and every day in life. I don't get it. You're just, you're walking through a whirlwind with no protection in my eyes. See, Christ gives contentment. He gives meaning. He gives purpose to your life. There's nothing greater than serving something eternal. Because if you get so focused on the secular, there's no meaning here. There, there's no fulfillment upon this earth. There's little glimpses of, of goodness and greatness, but there's nothing that lasts. And, you know, being a Christian, and this is just for me, I have this internal contentment and joy in my life. Even when things are wrong, going bad in my life financially, or there's a sickness, or there's a problem in my family, or with a friendship, I know deep down that God's got this all worked out for me, that he has a sovereign plan in mind. Okay? I wanted to start off this episode with this little section, and now we're going to go into chapter 5. All right? Now, I don't know if we're going to be able to make it all the way through chapter 5. I'm going to try. 
you can break chapter 5 down into two sections. The first one talks about false worship, and the second part talks about hoarding riches. Now, I think the hoarding riches aspect will probably speak to most of you guys, but I want to talk about false worship first. So let's look at uh, the first few verses. It says in chapter 5, verse 1, Guard your steps as you go to the house of God and draw near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know they are doing evil. Verse 2, do not be hasty in word or impulsive in thought to bring up a matter in the presence of God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Now, what is he talking about here? You, you know, going into the house of God is going into church. You're drawing near to God. And sometimes when he talks about the sacrifice of fools, he's talking about religious rituals. You know, many faiths, even within the Christian realm, they think that these rituals, these certain prayers, if they say them over and over repetitively, will do something like God's this horseshoe. Or, you know, if you open up the Bible and you read, it's kind of like, okay, God, I did this. Now you've got to listen to me. You know, that's not how it works. God is in heaven. You are on, on earth. Know your place. You cannot manipulate God. He's not this little God that you carry around in your pocket. He's not like one of those idols that people back in the day in the Roman Empire would leave on the shelf and they would pray to like the rain God and the sun God and the fertility God. And they, they would basically tell the God what to do. That's not how it works here. See, God's going to do what he's going to do and you're going to submit to him one way or another. Let me continue on a little bit. He says at the end of uh, verse 2, he says, and then this goes into verse 3 as a three as well he says therefore let your words be few for the dream comes through much effort and the voice of a fool through many words and what does that mean the dream comes through much effort and he's talking about work right now that a man who goes to work and he works hard and keeps his mouth shut he gets home he's tired he has deep sleep and he has dreams whereas the fool speaks many words okay because a fool talks a big game, but he never he never puts anything through it, okay? He never puts any effort forth. In verse 4, it says, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it, for he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech, in verse 6, do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. Rather fear God. What does all that mean? You see this a lot pictured in movies in Hollywood, and Hollywood. And you probably do this in real life. When the going gets tough, you would want to make a deal with God. And, it, and it, it blows my mind. I mean, I even catch myself doing this. When things start going wrong at work, or I get in an argument with my wife, or I get bewildered by you know what's going on in the government or I'm trying to do something with my kids and they won't obey and I'm like God can you just help me out here especially the financial aspects of my life because I am a straight commission sales so my income goes up and down and up and down and up and down and so sometimes I'll make deals with God I'm like God I can't close a deal to save my life can you just give me a deal give me a deal and I'll do this that's not how it works my friends or you got a sick kid at home and We've seen it. We've had, oh God, goodness, you guys. We've had some, some of our friends have kids get really sick, like liver transplant sick. And you're on your hands and your knees and you're crying out to God. And you're like, God, I will do this the rest of my life if you will just save my kid. That's not how it works. There's nothing wrong with going to God and expressing your sorrows, your emptiness, your fears, and asking him to help you. But be very, very careful in making deals with God. And remember your place. Remember that he's in heaven and you're on earth. And there's a reason why you're going through what you're going through. And that's why he closes it off right there and says, rather, fear God. The fear of God is not, oh no, God's going to strike me with lightning. The fear of God is knowing that he is all-powerful, sovereign, and in control of everything in our life. Fear him. Trust him. He is in control. All right. Let's go into the hoarding riches part. Because this, like I said, will probably speak to many of you. In verse 8, it says, If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness 
in the providence. Do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. Now, what this speaks of is political injustice. You know, you have one person in authority overlooking another person in authority, and they're all out for each other trying to make the most amount of money, and they're oppressing the people in order to do it. Okay, now I'm going to continue on. I'm not going to get too caught up in those verses. In verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with his, its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage of the owners except to look on? Okay. The people who live their life in the pursuit of money and wealth will never be satisfied. You know, you start off, you get out of college and like, oh, I just want to get a job that makes $35,000 a year. And then after that, you know, $35,000 is not enough because you've reached your budget. Now you want $50,000. So you move up to that. And now, now you're consuming even more because you have more income. Now you want $75,000. Then you want $100,000. Then you want $150,000. It is never enough. If your life is in the pursuit of money, there is no number that will ever appease you never then it talks about as you gather money people will begin to fall around you let's go back to what it says it says that uh when good things increase those who consume them increase have you ever noticed oh there was a really famous show on tv on hbo called entourage where this guy makes it big in hollywood and everywhere he goes his three buddies that he grew up with follow him around like like ticks just sucking on him because he's got all this wealth as you grow in wealth the people around you they 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 crowd around you and they want to consume everything that you have they're like leeches um you see this when people win the lottery you see this uh, prize fighters in boxing do you ever watch the prize fighter walk into the ring how many people are following behind him i mean you hear about like mike tyson you know he made like 300 million dollars and now he's bankrupt i mean people just sucked him dry there is no satisfaction in this life through wealth because there's never enough talk to a billionaire i mean the, the numbers that they throw out and, and there's there's a lot of things that come with wealth too let me continue on here it says uh verse 12 the sleep of the working man is pleasant whether he eats little or much but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep now i want you to think about that a little bit see i wake up every day and i go to work and i work and i work and i work because I've got to grind out enough money to pay my family's bills. So at the end of the day, I'm exhausted. And whether I eat a little or a lot, I have to, I've put in my day's labor and I'm gonna get rest and I'm gonna sleep easy. Whereas the rich man, since he has so much, he cannot rest easy because he's managing this wealth of his and all these people pulling at him from all sides. He does not have easy sleep. He allows his wealth and his greed to control him. Let me continue on. Verse 13, there is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. Verse 14, when those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. 15, as he had come naked from his mother's room, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. 16, this also is a grievous evil, exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. This man, he, he hoarded wealth, but then he lost it all. And since his, he defined his life and success by the wealth that he accrued and he had nothing, he lived with anxiety and despair and sadness. And the idea behind it is whether you are given much wealth or no wealth at all, you're going to come into this world naked and you're going to leave this world naked, okay? You can't take any of it with you, so don't let wealth control you. Wealth is a gift of God, okay? It's a gift from Him, and certain people are given it. The idea is if God decides to bless you with wealth, the best thing that you can do is give it away. Don't hoard it, because hoarding wealth will hurt you. I really, really want to keep on going, and so I'm going to continue on just for a little bit, so it's going to be a little bit longer than normal. Listen to this. Listen. Oh my goodness, you guys. Take this. 
in verse 18, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. There is nothing better than to enjoy the riches of God. You know, God gives you an income. Don't hoard it. Don't save for your future. Don't put it all aside, you guys. Take your family out to eat. Take your take your girlfriend out for a meal. Enjoy it now. I mean, don't blow everything that you have, but enjoy the wealth of God and enjoy the labor from which you acquire this wealth that he gives you. That is your reward. So people get so caught up saving for retirement and worrying about the future and what's going to happen three months from now and can I pay off this bill? God knows what you've got in front of you. You don't have to worry about it. Man, I live like this every single day. Living, working a straight commission job, you guys. Oh my goodness, it will drive you up the wall. I mean, I'm looking at things a month from now. I mean, we're going into back to school, so I gotta get clothes for the kids. That's like, I don't know, $700, $800. And then we have a, a family coming in from out of town at the end of September, so I gotta get money from that because they're gonna be here for like a week. And we're gonna entertain them, and we're gonna go do fun stuff. Then after that, we have sports. My son plays baseball. My, my daughter plays volleyball, so I gotta pay for that. And then we get the holidays. And in the holidays, my business takes a, a nosedive, so I have to have extra money in reserve. And then I gotta do my taxes, because I don't usually do my taxes till October, unlike most people. And on and on and on. Well, God knows all this stuff. I don't have to worry about that. I mean, I gotta be smart with my money, but I still need to enjoy today. There is always something coming. Enjoy today and enjoy the fruit of your labor, your drinking, your eating, all that good stuff, you guys. And I know I've trailed along a little bit here, but the idea is wealth can destroy you. And if you guys want me to speak more on wealth, I could probably talk about money till my face turns blue. So you just let me know down in the comment section below. I'm going to end it right here because I know I went a little bit longer. Heavenly Father, I just pray that these words would penetrate the hearts and the minds of the men and the women who are hearing them. And that for all those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would believe once and for all that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And the belief in that is the forgiveness for the sins that they committed in their lives, and that they could live in eternity with you forever. May you be glorified in our lives, Lord, and may we be blessed through it. In your heavenly and holy name, amen.